welcome to episode 46 of the Abyssin History Podcast, a platform to examine pre modern Islamic and Islamic hate history and a global medieval past. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Dan Hassan. A PhD student at School of Oriental African Studies. Now onto the show. Uh, we're very delighted today to try something quite new, which is a conversation with an author about his book uh, with a with a, with an audience as well. Uh, the book we are discussing is this: Disenchanting the Caliphate: The Secular Discipline of Power in Abbasid Political Thought, by Professor Hayreddin Ujasoy, uh, who's kindly uh, joining us from uh, St. Louis in Missouri, and he's a professor of, associate professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at Washington University there. And he also has another book called Messianic Beliefs and Imperial Politics in Medieval Islam, the Abbasid Caliphate in the early 9th century. And uh, uh, we're also work, work, uh, joined by Han Sien Liu as our um, co-host, and we're very grateful for his attendance too. Before we start in the book, just a signpost that's going to come ahead. So um, Hayreddin and I will talk for about an hour and sort of take a break. And then uh, we'll have opportunity to have a uh, discussion amongst um, us three. Um, so just for our audience, as an overview, what this book does is it looks at how the, the approach to thinking about the caliphate change from a adjunct of theological uh, discussions to one of politics in itself. It went from the language used in the book, it went from imama to siyasa. And I, I want to go through with Professor Yujasoy uh, chapter by chapter, because I think this was it was a profound experience reading this, right? I mean, I've got it all highlighted and like, annotations all the way through, throughout it and if we had the opportunity i would go through it paragraph by paragraph is that a fair summary of your of your book in terms of a, a overview yes well thank you very much let me uh let me thank you uh talha for doing this program i really appreciate it i am very happy to be joining you uh, about my book and i think it's very fair description the only thing that you know i want to add to what you have said is that it is not a matter of siyasa supplanting the imama. You know, they form two big rivers of political thought in Islamic history. So, you know, imama continues to be a vibrant tradition of political thought. What I am saying is that, you know, I mean, in addition to imama, from the middle of the 8th century onward, we have another big river competing and dialoguing with the imamate discourse you divide your book up into um eight chapters and i'm just going to give a brief overview of each before we sort of go through them the first chapter is um caliphal practice and and, and there you talk about these four forms of caliphal authority and I, and you also sort of mentioned sort of past secondary sources on islamic political thought uh then you talk about in the second chapter, the language Imam makes, and you go through a couple of books, Kitab al-Irja, attributed to Ibn al-Hanafiya, who, um, bear in mind, is the audience for this of all different backgrounds, so we kind of need to sort of not assume always that they know who we're talking about. Ibn al-Hanafiya was a son of Ali ibn Talib, but not from Fatima. That's why it's called Hanafiya, and he rebelled against the... Uh, Umayyad Caliphate. So he has this book attributed to him. And and also you, you look through a track by Salim bin Zakwan uh, as well. And in, in that you, you show how the language of Islamic politics is very different to this later figure who will come, come to Ibn Muqaffa. Uh, then you talk about the um, this political prose revolution and you talk, you talk about Abdul Hamid Al-Khatib's work and you, and you show this sort of shift in thinking of of, of in Islamic political uh, discourse. Uh, and then fourth chapter, we talk about 
the disruptive language of siyasa. And I, I guess that's a good point to be introduced to this figure, Ibn Muqaffa'a, okay? Uh, the, this this uh, Abbasid writer, probably better known for uh, Khalil al I think many of our viewers would probably know that, the animal fables. Then you go on to um, deconfessionalizing the caliph. And here we can talk more about Ibn Muqaffa's kind of conceptualization of the caliph and how it differs from these uh, earlier works. And then imperial law uh, and the change in how we think about territory and then changing how we think about people. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack, and I don't think we're going to do it in an hour. But um, let's start at the beginning. Where, so there's already been a couple, there's been loads of works in Islamic political thought, right? You have Rosenzell's work, you have... Um, Right. right. What, so where? What, let, let's just start from there. Where did you see the gap was that they always talk about? Where, where, where did you? What, what, what was you seeing missing that you felt the need for your intervention? So this is really the uh, the issue. You know, I have been dealing with you know quote unquote Islamic political thought since my graduate school years uh, in uh, in Jordan. And as I try to explain in the introduction of my book, that, you know, since the late 19th century onward, it started in the middle of the 19th century, but, you know, we see a, you know, um, a, a more robust development of studying the subject uh, in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, that, you know, we, I mean, in the both Orientalist scholarship and the Muslim scholarship at the time, we see a discourse emerging, not only about Islam as an entity, as a reified, uh, reified entity that we can talk about Islam does this, Islam do that, you know, Muslims do this, Muslims do that kind of thing. But we started to see the emergence of the concept or the framework of Islamic political thought too. So you know, this set the stage for a vibrant tradition of scholarship that actually take that 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 took religiosity religious practice religious thinking religious morality as advocated by ulama to be the basis of any political thought emerging in the history of muslim people so on the one hand that you could see that this is actually yes you know it's you know observable demonstrable that there is a vibrant tradition that focuses on theological principles of political thought. But because the framework of understanding is already actually predefined with religious vocabulary and assumptions, what I have noticed is that really, I mean, the ideas about non ulama centric political thought traditions, one, they were not really given the attention that they deserve. Two, it created a, a confused intellectual space where a lot of scholars, you know, didn't know how to deal with this, you know, dialectic between the two uh, traditions that I think should be st uh, studied on their own terms. Um, so that was really the gap, the gap for me um, uh, that, you know, I tried to explore a little bit more. Once you do not assume the principles of the ulama to be normative uh, in the 8th century and in the 9th century, then you open a new space for yourself to sit down and explore siyasa on its own terms. And when I did that, well, you know, there is, then, then the, I found out another picture emerging about the history of political thought in Islamic hate history. At, and and this is really what I try to do um, in my chapters. You know, they are distinct political thought traditions. Again, I have to emphasize they are intertextual and dialogic, like any other discourse, political discourse that we can find in world history. But they are separate. And this I try to demonstrate in my chapters. They are different in terms of their languages. They are different in terms of they are conceptualizing the ruler, you know, the sovereign and the caliph, and they are different in terms of really imagining the empire itself, and they think about law differently, and they think about the people of the empire differently as well. 
I mean, it's clearly demonstrated, for example, in the, in the language that they are using, as for example, uh, Talha, you have read the book. Now you can compare the language in the second chapter of the book and let's say, you know, compare it to the language of chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight in the book. You do have different really languages. And I think that was the gap that I wanted to uh, address and shift the discussion about political thought uh, from a current uh, ulema-centric state to a little bit more democratic, more multiple and pluralistic state where we can actually understand both of them on their own terms. I I, I want to um, look at these uh, four forms of the of, of caliph authority that that you highlight prior before we get to like Ibn sure. Muqaffa and, and and these guys um, new conceptualization right. Before I do that, let let let's untangle this title this in this enchanting. It's it's. It's an allusion to Weber. Um, just, just make clear to us what you don't mean by by that term, because you're not, you don't exactly mean it, but how, how Weber intended it, right? No, exactly. I don't mean it in the sense Weber used this term, and you know, I mean, it may be, and I, I don't want to really just just you know consume the discussion about you know what Weber means by that. But clearly, that's a, that's a you know that's a modernistic view where you have this, you know, uh, dichotomy between the tra tradition and then the disenchantment brought by, you know, science and modernity and, and the enlightenment. Here, what I mean is that until the rise of Siasa discourse about politics, politics was considered to be part of theology. And this is mm -hmm. this should not really strike one as very strange because, you know, I mean, you... When you think about the rise of history, uh, history writing in Islamic hate history, there is also a kind of really divergence, right, from hadith to history writing. Uh, in this case, too, you know, I mean, uh, when you read chapter two, you're going to see that there are a couple of principles. The ulama at the time thought about, uh, uh, used when they thought about politics. It is the issue about God's ordinances, the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, the uh, uh, legal uh, um, uh, legal uh, 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 rules and regulations, and the idea that you know, I mean, the life of the community, organization of the community, and politics of the community had to basically comply with you know the theological principles as they are being articulated by the ulama. And when the siyasa comes up and talks about politics on the ground with a language that does not really conform to the language of the ulama and they bring they they bring siyasa to the earth that you know i mean that you know, when you do a political action there would be consequence that is independent from religious reasoning this is what i mean by disenchantment now for the first time in islamic history that you talk about politics as something that that is related to contingency and to calculation of your political action because the assumption is that what you do is going to have a consequence that is not determined by theology but really by your action and this is the idea the whole idea that develops from here good governance right you know i mean the political virtue of the ruler right so this is really what i mean by disenchantment, and I think this is extremely important point to develop on, you know, um, in our political conversation about the political thought in Islamic eight histories. I, I really like the first chapter because I thought it was, just, it was a nice summary of which I think a lot of undergraduates could benefit from, and with the footnotes and stuff of like uh, like a nice potted history of sort of political. The, the political formation of, of, of early Islam. So let's talk about these four um, caliph authorities. You've got calif caliphal contractualism, God's caliphate, messianic leadership, and obviously the Shia Shiite imamate. Do you, do you do you just want to go through those uh, briefly as uh, um, what you meant by them and, and just just so so we've yeah, got sure. like a, some somewhere to start with before to, to sure. compare absolutely with what comes later. absolutely. I mean. Usually, when you read 
histories of political thought in Islamic uh, periods. I mean, a lot of the time you see, at least, especially the uh, three of them, as you know, use synonymous to each other, right? You know, Caliph, Imam, Khalifatullah, and the like. You know, I mean, people are aware of the differences, you know, between or among these titles. But I think there there was a kind of really confusion that I saw in scholarship that I thought maybe probably it is time to sit down and just briefly really talk about the difference among these four titles. They project different kind of really political authority. The caliph, the in contractualism, is that you know when you have a model, it is a model in which the community and the rules and regulations promulgated by the community. That is the Quran, the Hadith, and then the the ulama's ulama's really um, rules and regulations uh, in fiqh and Sharia. That you know the caliph has to comply with this, you know, foundations, right? So you know, he does not have, you know, authority that could exceed or go beyond the what the community what the community say, right? In and and you see that you know the caliph tried to bypass this kind of reunitation being basically responsible before the community to bypass that kind of limitation by resorting to being the caliphs of God. That, you know, when you do that, you bypass the uh, the community. Then you become an authority yourself, not responsible for what the community actually is doing. In fact, actually, you become a, you know, a shepherd of the community to, again, implement and execute God's laws. Right, you know the Sharia, and you know, I mean, at, at the time they used they used to use Ahkam al-Din or Shara rather than Sharia. Sharia is a little bit later, uh, but it it would apply to, I mean, my definition would apply to later periods as well. And the other one, uh, messianic leadership, is obviously is very different from both the uh, being you know caliph of God and being a caliph, right? Then it gives a a more explicit spiritual authority that not only uh, bypasses the community, uh, bypasses the community, but also actually the authority to change the structure of the divine law. Right? You know, Messiah has that kind of real authority to bypass the rules and regulations of the divine law as well. Uh, that person can bring new laws that would be. Bound, that would be bind, that would bind the community itself. So that is then therefore a different kind of really authority. Political practice would emerge from this kind of really uh, assumption. And the fourth one, the imam that I talk about, that is obviously in one hand, in, in, on one hand, it is a particularly a Shiite tradition as distinct from the other three. Uh, but on the other hand, it is much more common. Obviously, the Abbasids began to use it even before the Abbasids. We see it. It was used in the late uh, Umayyad period as well. That projects the caliph as both holding a political authority or secular authority combined with religious authority, a kind of really distillation, but not quite exactly like the messianic leadership. And this becomes something very common. Uh, with the Abbasids, and then, you know, all the political discourse that you see in books of theology and fuqah and hadith is discussed under the title of imamat rather than caliphate. I think this is an important point to make in here because, I mean, there is a reason why uh, religious scholars, ulama, discussed the caliphate not under the title of the caliphate, but under the title of the imamat. And, you know, these are you know, I mean, the nuances between these two titles, I think, very important to pay attention to, because then you understand the fine but significant differences among variety of political schools in Islamic history. In your s second chapter, um, you you look through these early epistles just to demonstrate this point of how the discussion of Imama 
it was like a part of sort of theological discussion. So, what 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 is a what makes a Muslim? What takes someone outside of Islam? Are our actions pre-decreed? Uh, so we have no freedom and all of and so so the, then then the caliph was sort of discussed sort of like within that rubrics. So why don't you tell us what you, about these texts that you covered there, uh, Kitab al Irja and uh, um, Ibn Zakwan's um, tract and. But why don't why don't we look up these various um, uh, tracks and epistles and, and books that you cover in in the second chapter, just so we understand this this contrast that you're making? Sure. So in order to understand the rise of Siasa as a distinct, significant a political thought tradition, I mean I think I felt that there was a need to uh, to understand you know to. Uh, observe the imama discourse up to that point and there are luckily there are you know some texts that you know one can use to illustrate uh, this difference and how siasa was actually a basically a rapture a discontinuity a, you know i mean destabilizing intervention but you know i mean in this in this chapter i talk about the early formations of the imamat discourse and as you have seen in the chapter, the, 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 the politics, well, what I call it really pre-politics, because a, the reason why I do that, because the political ideas that are espoused over there do not necessarily deal with politics on the ground. There is this huge assumption that looms very large, and you, now you probably are going to recognize immediately that politics for them meant implementing God's ordinances, divine law, and that would take care of itself, right? Once you do that, then therefore, you know, the community is going to live a peaceful and righteous life. So then therefore, they did not really pay attention that much to the regulations on the ground. That's why, for example, the main issue for this ulema individuals that I am dealing with is not really, you know, the practice of the governments, whether the caliph implements God's laws or not, whether the caliph is a good, pious Muslim or not. This concern is not, this question is not really a big concern for the Siasa writers, as we are going to be seeing in, in later chapters. And the other one is obviously their understanding of politics is a around the community, right? You know, they think about this, you know, Muslim community without any attention to territorial identity of, of the caliphate. And they do not think about the caliph's authority as somebody who implements actually rules and regulations and laws to govern in a way that, you know, that make that uh, basically political practice uh, agreeable to the community. In fact, just the opposite is true. As long as you have divine law or religious law, that has to be implemented, whether the community accepts it or not. So, you know, I mean, and the language that they are using, you know, if you uh, if you look at chapter two, is basically a, 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 a theological language, right? You know, I mean, the Quranic verses, then increasingly hadith, then extrapolations are based on, you know, I mean, religious extrapolations. So they portray a universe, a political universe that is defined and determined by the divine laws as they are expressed by the ulama in the 8th century, all the way, you know, all the way to the middle of the century, and obviously will continue later on as well. And this, I thought, is something uh, that, you know, I have to notice in the book. I have to put it there so that, you know, I mean, the reader can see actually how drastic uh, difference there is between the proponents of the imamat and the proponents of Siasa. In, uh, but but in Talha, let me mention another point just, you know, I mean, to make it even clearer. I... Uh, I discuss another related point in here in probably one or two pages and you know mention it in different times as well. 
the concept of siyasa itself, the word siyasa itself, emerges among this uh, bureaucrat, literati, lay intellectuals. And you know what? The ulama do not use it approximately until the middle of the ninth century. You don't see it in Abu Yusuf. You don't see it in al -Ambari. You don't see it all the way through the middle of the ninth century. The first alim, Al-Jahaz uses it here and there, but not really in, in a very political sense. The first person to use it in a political way is Ibn Qutayba. And Ibn Qutayba, that's why as, you know, Ibn Qutayba is a very important person to discuss in terms of, you know, I mean, again, this kind of really dialogic relationship of the ulama with the Siyasa people. So c come to the third chapter. I mean, you start off saying, I contend that the discourse of Siyasa emerged not gradually because of an, of an accumula accumulation of knowledge, but as a rupture with right. the potential to destabilize the idea of the imamate and change the scene of political reflection. Here you talk about Abdul Hamid al-Khatib. So why don't, you, why don't you tell us about him and this um, class of people, these uh, literati people, these bureaucratic class of people, before we get to Ibn Qafa. Right. I mean, it's you know, just amazing when you think about this subject. We are talking about the late Umayyad times, the beginnings toward the middle of the 8th century, what I describe as the Salem school of Siyasa. Right? You remember that from the book. You know, you have Salem, who is a, a very prominent a bureaucrat in the Umayyad administration, and you have Abdul Hamid, who is the friend and also mentor Ibn Mukaffa and you know other individuals, both working in the uh, administration of the Umayyads, right. but at the same so just, time, just, think just, about so interrupt just for the listeners Salim bin Abdul Rahman Abu Ala, he died 720 common era, yeah, right. So they are working for the Umayyads in the administration, but at the same time, they are intellectual on their own. They write uh, writings, they translate uh, writings, uh, and then therefore they pay att intellectual attention to political thought as well. And that's why, for example, it is only in their writings, in the Salem School of Siyasa, that we see politics, quote-unquote, Siyasa discussed in this kind of really down-to-earth, practical, maybe pragmatic way. And, and therefore, you know, I mean, they their intellectual, political intellectual genealogies do not go back to the ulama, but rather, rather actually to like more world historical, cosmopolitan writings about the, about politics, like, you know, I mean, ancient, for example, Greek philosophy, uh, ancient uh, Sasanian political practice and thought and the like. Uh, and th therefore, I describe their writings as really just basically a rupture rather than a continuation of the ulama's writing about the imamat, because they start from a totally different, really, perspective. Obviously, you know, I mean, anyone reading uh, the emergence of Siyasa uh, that you're going to recognize they live in a particular society among a particular community and the social and political space is not vacant, right? You know, they have to basically respond to their own circumstances, right? You know, you can't just ask them to write as if they were living under the Sasanians, right? Therefore, I mean, you know, when you look at their discussion that, you know, they try to engage the current a understanding of society and politics and respond to it. And one of the bigger, biggest the evidence of that that I talk about is Abdul Hamid. Um, I, I, I think probably I am the first one to make a distinction between the early Abdul Hamid and late Abdul Hamid. That, you know, you can't just study Abdul Hamid just as Abdul Hamid, right? There is a process of change in the thought of Abdul Hamid as you know he was working with the Umayyads. If you look at the writings of early Abdul Hamid, 
you're going to see that, you know, he was very close to the imamate people, right? You know, I mean, he was talking about politics from within the framework of the imamate discourse at the time. Later, Abdul Hamid, especially as I, I take two of his treatises to discuss, now UCN and Abdul Hamid is actually moving toward Siasa discourse. And then therefore, you know, there is a platform over there for Ibn al mukaffa to grow more, right? And this is, that's why I mentioned this is actually a rupture rather than basically a continuation. Now, you, we are really observing in, the, in 50 years or so, the genesis of what I call, obviously, you know, now it is uh, in the title of the book, secular a understanding of politics. And the secular, I mean, not necessarily as a doctrine, as I talk about in the introduction, and not something that, you know, that's, you know, always attached to the particular European experience in modern times, but really something that uh, uh, separating political thinking from the over-determination of theological discourse, that, you know, opening a space were not theological discourse, but really the contingency is the significant platform for uh, intellectual speculation. So in, the, in that sense, uh, in, in, in that set, it's secular. In another sense is that uh, politics has become mutable intellectual uh, enterprise. I mean, the, uh, sorry, political practice, right? Because, you know, when you think about politics, according to the imamate discourse, uh, proponents at the time, it is not really mutable. It is immutable. God sends prophets, send laws. The only thing you need to do is basically implement them, regardless of the time, regardless of the place, you know, regardless of the outcome. Here you see secular in the sense that, you know, no, it has to do with time, with place, right? And I think this is a enough rapture, you know, to call it that. There's a couple of things which I really liked about this chapter. The, the, the discussions of the mole of the Mola class are those quite touching, actually. Um, actually, I actually when we spoke before we came on here, the, the, I actually wanted to read an extract, but I, I guess I guess readers can 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 do that themselves. We talk about Fanon and the way this Fanon suddenly just came on France Fanon, all the rest of the earth. The way that came in from nowhere, <laughs> it really took me aback, and I, it, it sort of made me think. Just like, just to just to get under the skin of these people, these class of people, you have the Islamic conquests. You have a whole bunch of people there who are already established. They, you know, you try to just imagine all the different responses. Some obviously would be very hostile. Some would be resigned to new powers. Some are pragmatic. Some are like, no, we're not going to give up the ways of our forebears. And 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 what I loved about this chapter is, is that you're just trying to understand like the, the sort of the psychology of 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 these people, uh, like Ibn Mukaffa and their parents. And um, why don't you tell us more about that? Because I thought, well, like, where did where did like Fan, Fanon coming from nowhere? To talk about medieval Islamic uh, politics, although well, why don't you, why don't you t to tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that you know you were surprised, and I thought uh, you know I, I thought you know I mean Fanon's discussion of you know colonialism, colonial intellectuals, you know psychology of the subalterns and the like, he would be a good metaphor to let the readers think about the a, a really agonizing nature uh, of trying to establish or re-establish yourself in a society that clearly uh, now is a dominant one and have changed a lot of things, right? So, I mean, that is really the, the question. Let me give you uh, an example so that you know I can illustrate what I am trying to accomplish in that in, in, in the chapter. I mean and, and then to, to tie this back to my uh, discussion about 
the language of politics and why language is very, very important and why we should pay attention to language, not so much really as authorial intent uh, or uh, just trying to understand the belief of the author, but really what it does in practice. I mean, Taha, yeah, just to be you know, frank and honest about this, is that, you know, the point that you name these people as Mawali, you are already creating social distinctions that 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 is going to create a kind of really social political tension, right? I, I, uh, I came up with this term called molophobia. As a, it just sprang oh, to yeah, my head. As, very as good, I, as of I course. <laughs> it is not just molophobia. It is not just molophobia. It is, I mean, even if you don't have a molophobia, uh, when you create a social category identified by certain aspect, you know, I mean, you basically have the ability, if you have the power, you would have the ability to control it in a way that you define it, right? You know, I mean, this is not just about the Mawali, obviously. Think about, for example, when we talk about until the, you know, <laughs> almost the 19th century, less 18th century, let's say, I mean, we didn't have a working class, but with the Industrial Revolution, you know, people working in the factories in the 18th century, in the 19th century, until Marx, well, people talked about it before, but, you know, I mean, this is the this is the person who actually just made it a worldwide significant term, named it as the working class. Then you have a working class. You can talk about it. You can problematize it. You can an an analyze it. Here, too, we have a similar really process in here that, you know, when you name a particular social group based on one aspect of their lives, you create in a condition in which that social group, however large it is, that, you know, and you put it in a certain social hierarchy that they could not escape from, you know, not easily escape from, let's say. You know, I mean, later on, obviously, intermixing and uh, mingling people and the like, obviously, we have a different uh, conditions later on. But initially, you have that kind of really distinction. So in this kind of really framework, I mean, it is just basically uh, unfair not to think about how these people living on these conditions, not to think about their own situation, not to think about their ways of trying to become uh, effective members in the society. And ultimately, I am talking about intellectual discourse an elite group of people. So, you know, both Ab Abdul Hamid and also uh, Ibn al Mukaffa are elite. Elite in the sense that, you know, I mean, they got excellent positions. They lived a, you know, I mean, well to do life. You know, they had a lot of influence around themselves. But at the same time, even them lived in a condition where they had to basically give, you know, make a lot of concessions you know, to be able to hold on their positions and to, to live dignified lives. Uh, and clearly from their writings, we understand that they try to make the caliphate their own as well. And, you know, right. otherwise we can't really explain, explain why Ibn al-Mukaffa, all his la short life, translated books about this subject. Right? You know, the, the, the caliphate, good governance, um, uh, in the Siasa discourse, you know, I mean, trying to have consent of the subjects of the empire uh, when one rules and the like. You know, I mean, how do we explain then his really just dedication to translating books about the subject? Ibn al-Mukaffa did nothing but basically writing about politics, nothing else. Even Khalil Dimna, as I talk in the book, obviously, in some chapters, is a book about politics, politics right? Exactly. So, uh, therefore, uh, uh, but you know, that is a point you know, I'd like to make in here that you know it is not an issue between the Arabs and the non-Arabs, and I mean this is the this is what the traditional scholarship uh, is trying to portray that you know I'm basically pushing back against. It is a particular social class 
well, a particular Arabic speaking Muslim social class that is really benefiting from this. It's not the Arabs or not the Muslims against the non-Arab Muslims. It is a particular social class. We have to make that distinction because you, if you are a Christian Arab, you are not part of the you know non-Mawali. If you are, for example, just regular uh, working or peasant uh, Arab Muslims, who cares whether your neighbor is Mawali or not? Because you are already this, this you know, simple life, basically. Maybe content, but simple life. But if you are in a position that you control social relations, basically you control social groups that you benefit from being non-Mawali. You benefit, you benefit from naming those people Mawali, right? And then therefore you create a social hierarchy, hierarchy where you are dominant. And, and this is really what I'm trying to uh, uh, analyze so that, you know, as a background for uh, why these early intellectuals dealt so much with politics. To, to, I, I want to make two points about class. You know, I mean, obviously I, you know, I use it uh, not uh, in the sense of the 19th century, 20th century yeah. uh, sense of class. But at the same time, the second point is that let's think about our own categorization because we have so much invested in the modernity and pre-modernity binary that, you know, I mean, that kind of really binary blinds us to see things that otherwise actually are uh, are very obvious so i mean how do we talk about the mawali if we do not as a an entity in urban centers in rural areas if we do not talk about social class well the other alternative that has been always in the forefront is that you talk about them as religious community fair okay but you know we are not talking about a homogeneous religious community in here right you have it, all uh -huh. sorts of you know religions all sorts of sects and all of that why should one shy too much away from the notion of class so that you know i mean we can identify what we are talking about rather than just basically lean on the crutches of culturalist arguments so this is i mean therefore you know i'm not a person who thinks about history in terms of I mean, radically different phases, modernity and pro modernity. In fact, actually, I think, I mean, this is a construction while useful, like, for example, using the term Middle East. Well, there is some questions to ask. Right? And this is what I try to do in chapter two. Um, OK, Let, let's actually now get to Ibn Muqaffa, because I, I think we've delayed talking about him for too long. OK, sure. because he's really sort of the center of this entire book. And you talk about his work on the, the, the two works on he has on politics. Let's 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 just jump into to Ibn Qaf. What did he do? This disruptive language of Siasa. What what was it that he did that is the, the foundation of everything sure. we talk about now? Ibn al Mukaffa is a very interesting personality for sure but also an intellectual you know this is a guy who actually all his life dealt with practice he was in the administration i mean uh, clearly that he had uh, higher uh, career goals uh, you know being with the caliph for example the uh, al mansur that you know i mean uh, well, he was not successful in that but you know it is he is an amazing uh, political intellectual all of his writings that we know that we can authenticate to him, both writings and also translations are actually about politics. So then you have you have an intellectual here who has invested in creating an impact in the society in which he lived. And obviously, the, the, the question that we need to talk about uh, later on, maybe in other series, is that, you know, what was he to, to trying to do, right? You know, but you know, let me leave that question aside. So he translated books from Persian, but clearly his political thought genealogy is Hellenistic. 
Hellenistic in the sense that it benefits from both Persian and Greek and also Indic traditions, right? You know, I mean, Kalila Dimna, you know, I'm mean, just the, the, the biggest example of that. So, um, and therefore, yeah, I mean, the way that, you know, I mean, for example, his writings uh, deal with politics is something that actually is, you know, I mean, destabilizes the current discussion about the imamat, about the caliphate, about political life, but at the same time actually provides a counterpoint to imamat, right, which is basically, I mean, this foregrounding basically the political practice, foregrounding is that I, I, I call it soft consequentialism, right? You know, I mean, that, you know, your action has a particular result. That then, therefore, you know, I mean, the ruler when does a particular action that, you know, I mean, he has to calculate the political outcome of that, that step, right? You know, this is something that, you know, you don't see. And, you know, let me give you one example so that, you know, we can understand better the kind of really disruption his writings about politics created. I mean, political virtue. Right. I mean, how can we gain uh, or how the ruler uh, attain political virtue? If you listen to the imamat discourse uh, up until the ninth century and, and, and some even afterwards as well, but that's that's a different discussion. Political virtue is nothing but implementing God's ordinances. Right. I mean, that is really what political virtue is. God send you. Um, his message, the Prophet Muhammad applied that in his life and then therefore the Imams have nothing to do but really implementing it uh, in their realm. That is the you know, I mean, that is really political virtue. When Ibn al-Mukaffa talk about political virtue, that you know, I mean, what is it to be a good uh, caliph, then you see the emphasis on political practice. The political practice has to uh, basically uh, aim at two things. One is that you have to make sure that you know what you do politically creates actually a good outcome. And the good outcome is not just basically the success of whatever law you are enacting, but also uh, creating a kind of really consent, satisfaction uh, among your imperial subjects. And the other component is that, you know, it cannot be just basically holding on to your power. You can't ju just do that uh, to just basically keep your seat. And that you could do by basically becoming a tyrant. Right. You know, I mean, you punish everybody in the way that, you know, you want so that, you know, everybody is suppressed and then your seat is not challenged. But this is tyranny. Right. But, you know, for Ibn al-Mukaffa, siyasa is the way to do it. That is really the hub of political virtue. That means actually just you take precautions and act laws, you know, administer your realm in a way that is peaceful that involves negotiation and at the end of the day create a consent among your subjects that you know i mean you feel comfortable in your seat so therefore you know i mean in the 8th century ibn al mukaffa is much the significance of him is much much beyond the 8th century much much beyond just basically talking about the early abbasids and the later umayyads and it's really at the you know he sits at the foundation of secular political discourse in uh, the histories of Muslim Muslim people. Therefore, he was cited by so many other siyasa writers and then later on imama writers as well. So the last few bits about how law, the concept of law changes. Right. And then you say here, Ibn Mukaf uh, intervened with a game-changing epistemological position in his legal proposal to more than control the revealed law, deen, or curb the autonomy of the jurist vis-a-vis -vis that of the caliph, but instead to create a law that was imperial rather than religious, thus reducing the religious law of the ulama to just a legal body, among, among others. 
and the ulama themselves to function in the capacity as legal and religious experts. So let's 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 just summarize what you've said about him on law. Then uh, after that, you talk about um, his reconceptualizing of the territory and his shift of of caliphal focus to the east. And finally, you end with how he reconceptualized the notion of ummah as well, which was quite was quite interesting, especially in light of like all these recent discussions about ummatics and stuff, right? But the thing is, we've got we've got there's so much to talk about. But anyway, let's just go through that law, territory, people, and that's the end of the book. You know, let let's go with the you know with the idea of the law, right? I mean, a uh, I don't know how much background I need to give, but, you know, I mean, just let me state it very briefly. Up until Ibn al-Mukaffa's intervention, when we thought about law, when we thought about, when we thought about, when we think about law, we think about, well, one portion is that the political practice of the caliph themselves, irrespective of what the ulama were saying, but increasingly what the ulama were saying becomes more prominent with the Abbasids, right? You know, I mean, so then therefore you have the ulama and you have their you know, Fuqa basically becoming a prominent portion of the uh, uh, of the Abbasid Caliphate's practice, and they are pushing actually for more. And the and the, the Abbasid Caliphs are receptive to that because it does help them uh, govern, right? So what uh, and, and in that kind of really scenario, I mean, you have what Ibn Kafa is reacting against is that you know, I mean, the law, the whole law that we are talking about in the empire is going to be religious law, right? You know, what the ulama uh, were basically promulgating. And not only that, they are, you know, they are not only just basically laws to implement, but they are also just, you know, arbitrarily across the society. I mean, you become an alim, you become basically a, a figure of authority, then you actually give a judgment uh, that totally contradicts the, uh, another judgment for the same case in a different town, actually in the same town. So Ibn al mukaffa is irritated by that. But this is his proposal that I think is very innovative, that I think probably I am the only one, you know, I mean, saying it or dividing it in this way. I mean, according to him is that there are three portions of law, right? One of them is firm religious ordinances. But, you know, I mean, and according to him, these are very few that the ruler must implement. There is no discussion over that for the ruler, for the for the ulama. But you know these are very narrow uh, ordinances. The other one, there are a substantial portion uh, in religious ordinances and law that is interpretive. That you know, I mean, you have an opinion, I have an opinion about it. And he says, well, the ruler has the authority to decide what to do, and he proposes a process for that. Right, it is not just you know Al Mansur or Harun Rashid decides what to do and then therefore does or do, and you know there is a process. He offers a process basically to do that, and the third one, and I think this is probably my contribution about this, is that you know I mean, it it has not been noticed that he does see a realm in which rational judgment also determines uh, rules and regulation and laws. That is, of the, the three components basically uh, constitute uh, the law uh, uh, in the empire. So now, with by doing that, is that obviously now he's trying to create an M, a law for the empire, right? You know, there is an empire, and there is actually just you know the the the, the law for the empire to be implemented and controlled by the caliph. If you ask the ulema at the time and later on, is you know their understanding is basically empire for the law, right? The empire exists to implement religious laws. For Ibn Mukaffa, it's just the way around. Right? There is an empire, and there is the law is for the empire. And this, you know, I mean, briefly, this is really what I'm talking about in the chapter. So there is another fascinating discussion in the next chapter that, you know, I mean, the, for the first time in Islamic history, we do see a territorial consciousness that was not before and that is continue to be not there among the ulama for a long time. If you read, for example, 
uh, Abu Yusuf al Ambari, you don't get that kind of really imperial consciousness. In some sense you do, but in some other senses you don't. And I will give you one example so that's going to make it clear, which I discuss in the book. I mean, he talks about the empire, but, you know, I mean, he mentions Egypt. He mentions the Middle East, like, you know, I mean, for example, the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq and Iran and the like, and he talks about them specifically, right? During the time he was writing his treaties, in North Africa and Spain was a big concern for the Abbasid Caliphs and continued to be a concern all the way to the time of Harun al-Rashid, even afterwards. Clear, they organized ex expedition to North Africa, they appointed governors to North Africa and the I Iberian Peninsula, right? And this is my question. Why does Ibn al-Mukaffa erase North Africa and, and, and Andalus from his political calculation? It does not appear in his writing. Why? He could not be ignorant, you know, I mean, not to know that North Africa and Spain uh, or the Iberian Peninsula were an important political concern for the Abbasid Caliphs. I mean, it is a huge territory that you can't just minimize, right? But there is, I mean, my interpretation is that, you know, he did have an imagination of the empire, that what he thought was the empire, what he thought was the actually just, you know, I mean, essential territories of the empire that the Abbasid should rule, that did not include uh, North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. Territorial, and this is for me, is territorial consciousness. That, you know, I mean, that, you know, something that we associate really with, like more than like, modern states and the like, you know, I mean, just, uh, but clearly here there is an element of that in here, that he thinks about the empire in terms of actual territories and borders. And he talks about them, each one of them in a specific way to constitute a portion of the empire in its totality. And one thing, and that is another, you know, I mean, chapter that moving to the final chapter about the subjects of the empire, that now first time again in the history of the Muslims that we see now the people of the empire as, are seen as imperial subjects. For the ulama, they are basically the ummah, right? In the believers and obviously the non-believers, the mawali and ahl al-kitab, and the rest. And, you know, I mean, this is, there is a discussion about that as well. I mean, um, uh, but, you know, I'm not going to be talking about uh, in here. So, we, I mean, for the first time that you see that now Ibn al-Mukaffa is thinking about actually imperial subjectivity irrespective of religious background. I mean, he's writing for the Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur. He knows the conditions on the ground. How do you explain that, you know, he does not even once mention non-Muslims, Mawali, in his writing? And his discussion about Muslims also is very, very minimal and in very specific. My interpretation is that he does not see the people, he does not represent or depict those people through religious similarities and differences. He presents them through their imperial subjectivity. They are the subjects of the caliph, right? So then you have a different kind of really conceptualization of the society, the caliphal society itself, where you have the caliph and when you have the imperial subjects and regulating the interaction between, between the two. And therefore, that this is political. The idea of the ummah by the ulama at the time is non-political, right? Because they don't think about them in this kind of really political ways. You know, there is nothing really political that you can build on them, right? You know, they are thinking, and this is when we started to hear, you know, the idea of, for example, the discussion Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. This is really exactly the, the, the era in which that discussion became, became uh, a part of... Uh, the fuq discussion, right? And in, in here that you can see that, you know, there is now among the 
the proponents of the imam some attention to okay the world is larger than the muslim the muslim community is actually in these regions what's happening outside them this became a question but at the same time it is not really just formulated in territorial way and the people within the empire are not considered to be just basically subjects of the empire right here ibn al-muqaffa does that and this is what i am you know i i talk about in the chapter uh hans i'm going to let you um give you a chance to uh, talk because you're smarter than me and uh much better read since this isn't a novel i'm just going to give away the last line of the book right because um i think someone could say well yeah ibn muqaffa had this great proposal someone could say cynically just to get a better job from the second abbasid caliph and now they've established themselves and you know set up baghdad and these people are here to stay and here's this guy he thinks now right i can get myself a, a nice cushy job here the question is did he have any influence even though it seems he didn't within his lifetime right and you end I hope my argument encourages a new historiographical possibility, one in which the non-ulama centric histories of good governance can be told in more productive and constructive ways. After all, the most renowned theoretician of the imamites, Al-Mawardi, himself acknowledges the distinction between the two moralities of governments in the very title of his magnum opus, Sultanic Ordinance and Religious Deputations, Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyya, well, we lie at Adinia. Um, so I guess now is your question is that before, before Han Sien gets a chance to speak, just briefly looking ahead, you've written the book, where do you want us to be going now in terms of our studies of the history of Islamic political thought? Well, you know, I mean, obviously what really emerges from this book is uh, is that you know we have to pay attention more to the distinction between the imamat and siyasa and conduct our studies you know based on the awareness of this distinction that will create another literature about the political thought traditions in the histories of muslims that you know i mean one of the motivation of this book was for me is that obviously we are historians living in the uh, 21st century now and we look for the future right and you know we are motivated by our own questions mm. and, you know how do we really create a better future mm. for ourselves as human beings and as you know people uh, uh, coming from uh, the uh, you know the the uh, history of islamic aid, in islamic aid people whether we define ourselves religious or not religious that that is really immaterial but, you know, there is this reality that, you know, 1.5 billion Muslims around the world that mm. can constitute a substantial part of our world today. And it's going to be also, uh, obviously, in the future. So how do I contribute to a better future? Right. You know, I mean, what is the ways in which that, you know, my, you know, historical, basically background as people, political thought traditions in the past, inform and inspire us to create a better future so i mean i guess my hope would be well uh, uh, scholars like me study the history of political thought through a new really lens through a new understanding that we can't just bundle up things together and just basically uh, do not pay attention to actually this kind of really fine but significant nuances in political thinking and political practice. So just to give you uh, something that what I am going to be doing, uh, hopefully that, you know, obviously, I mean, here we should not get the sense of minimizing the significance of the imam at discourse, right? You know, it is a substantial political thought traditions in the histories of Muslims. But, you know, I mean, we have to recognize that as well because it is the dialogical partner right of the siasa discourse so my next book project that i have already actually started is uh, talking about a, a particular aspect of the imamat discourse which is basically in the notion of election notion of consultation and notion of consent 
I think these are fantastic ideas, you know, in not just the histories of Muslims, but also in world history. Just so I'll give you one, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just very short line in here. Up until the, you know, modern times, let's say, think, think about the 13th century, 14th century type of thing. If you look at the political traditions in world history, east and west, north and south, you're going to see one dominant form, right? And that is, as everybody knows, monarchy, right? You have monarchy, you know, since ancient times all the way. Ex for, you know, I mean, except few places, some places in Mesopotamia, the Greek tradition, Right, and then you have you know city states in Europe again in the 14th and the 15th century, Italian city states and the like. But you do have a good example in the early Caliphate history too, and I think that has to be recognized a significant element in the in in, in global political history. Right, I mean that this mm. what I call the republican practices, right of politics that you know i mean i this is my next project to, to work to write a book about the islamicate republicanism in world history wow <laughs> Ancien, do you want to you want to uh, contribute yeah sure i i i, I have a, a lot of very scattered thoughts as as i was listening to you know to both of you talk about the book and especially with 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 um you know with with, with Hyder Din, uh you know just running through his thoughts and and how he came up with these different arguments so i i i i i, I, I took a lot of notes i was scribbling a lot of notes and 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 you know making points that uh that i i might want to ask him about so uh i mean I, I, as someone who has not read the book um you know i'm i'm sure as i read the book uh eventually i would have a, you know Hopefully, we'll, we'll have better clarifications on on, on these questions. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting actually, Harudin, that you mentioned your 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 next project on 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 election consent and, and consultation. Um, uh, there's a there's a, a very recent book by Muhammad Al Merhab uh, on uh, political thought in the Mamluk period, uh, where, where where he talks about so, so he he alludes to. I mean, he 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 doesn't he doesn't talk specifically about say election consent or consultation but but he talks about uh he uses these terms uh the rule of law delegation of power um and um i forgot what what's the the third one but but he but he's looking at it in, in the mamluk period so so i think it'd be interesting to for you to contribute that that perspective with the with the early caliphate i i, I think that's that's going to be very, very interesting um so we can i mean in 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 the in in the historiography of Western political thought with someone like Quentin Skinner are they doing that? I I, I think it, the the um you know with, with his foundations foundations of modern political thought I I think it'd be interesting to have an Islamic contribution to that very conversation as well and you know so I'm 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 not sure if if you know th that that's how you eventually see a project but but I think it'd be interesting to 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 kind of think of the think of that along these lines as well. Um, so I I I think I I mainly have two um, um, sort of bigger umbrellas for for the thoughts I have in my mind. Um, so I, I I think that the first is on the siyasa issue. Uh, so you 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 talked about uh, the political discourse in Islamic history kind of diverging into you you call it the two big rivers of siyasa and and the discourse of the imamate. Uh, so. I, I myself, I, you know, as you know, I, I work on Ibn al-Jawzi. I, I, he's, he's coming from a later period uh, in, in the 12th century. And I think by this time, there was, uh, there's just a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of heat around uh, the word siyasa and, and, and how it becomes this, you know, sort of bad word or, or boogeyman for everything that's considered bad in, in government at that time. And, uh, and, and and especially looking at the the ulama that themselves, um, you know, and I'm and, and, and you know Ibn al Jawzi was was one of one of them. Even even though I I think even within the the ulama that there can be further distinctions as to 
say the jurists, um, you know, the 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 the, the, the popular preachers, for instance. But I, I think among the ulama, that that, that there is a, a a huge, um, very heated discussion over the 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 concept of siyasa and and shar, the, the, what you mentioned, shar or or, or sharia. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I was wondering if if you you um you 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 kind of you eventually sacked into that uh, while speaking about the, the these two rivers between say the imama and siyasa. And so you know, um, did you you know, is there a bridge between these two the move the kind of divergence of these two rivers and how it potentially flowed into this very heated discussion in in the later Abbasid period. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans. I mean, this is really fantastic. Um, um, one thing about, you know, Quentin Skinner, obviously, I have read his writing and he's, you know, one of the really conceptual uh, inspiration of my writing as well, as I explained in the beginning of the book. Uh, Ahsan probably is going to remember. So, you know, I mean, I think what he is doing in terms of, you know, trying to rethink the European political thought, and the Renaissance and and the later uh, political thought is very significant. So, you know, there is a lot of inspiration in terms of, you know, my own thinking about the matter. Um, after all, I mean, we are talking about, uh, you know, human societies, you know, politics, uh, a cross pollination, a lot of translation, a lot of interaction, you know, all of that. So, you know, I mean, we can't think about them, you know, like the modernist wants us to think is that two separate really world that has, you know, that that have no correspondence with each other. So that is something that, you know, I mean, we should really probably leave behind. But anyways, to your uh, topic, it is very important. And obviously, I mean, uh, right from the beginning of this conversation, you know, I'm talking about, you know, Yes, two distinct political thought, thought traditions, but they have always and they had to remain dialogic, right? So, you know, I mean, they are talking about the same society. They live in the same society, like, you know, I mean, Siasa proponents and Imama proponents. I mean, they are writing against each other and with each other, right? So then, therefore, it is not not surprised that the Siasa becomes appropriated by the ulama. I mean, I use this term in a in a loving way. It is not, you know, uh, so uh, you know they 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 deal with it. But obviously, I mean, my argument does not just basically minimize the historical changes between the eighth century to let's say you know eleventh century, twelfth century, and fourteenth, the thirteenth century onward. Right? You know, I mean, we have to look at this kind of really so societies. To understand the dynamics in that particular time uh, time period, but there is an overlap, there is a bridge, you know, there is back and forth, and there is also uh, synthesis, right? You know, I mean, while between Ibn Mukaffa and the Imam at discourse, there is a clear distinction, right? Uh, but you know, for some, you know, like Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, CSS Sharia, for example, right? I mean, so we have to keep that in mind. So you have to analyze. So I think my argument in the book is going to give the scholars a new window to rethink, you know, otherwise really not very thought about matters in analyzing these texts, right? You know, knowing that there is actually, we are talking about two distinct traditions of political thought, that now we can go back and read Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn al-Jawzi to see you know, I mean, what is really, for, for example, the you know the the interplay between the two, or what is really the distinction? What do they mean when they say actually use these concepts? And I think you know, I mean, that awareness is in itself very important. So, but yes, you know, obviously, I mean, on the other side too, when you look at the Siasa uh, uh, discourse proponents. See that they are also impacted by what the imamate discourse, the the, the imamate political thought, were you know was contributing, so that then you see them just you know becoming cl closer to that, appropriating some arguments from the imamate discourse, and because of the location where they lived in you know a particular time period, that you know I mean clearly they had to basically, because they are writing about politics in a particular context that has to do with politics, right? 
you can just think about them as you know isolated from their context they are addressing the pressing questions of their time sometimes this would be you know i mean paying attention more to uh, imamat and religious discourse at other times it would be the other way around right so yes yeah so, so, thank you very very much for 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 that comment um i mean the, the so the the other big question that that i have in mind uh, as i hear you speak is um i i, I was very, very intrigued by your comment about um you know for 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 the for the imama discourse uh, especially for the ulama um politics meant in a way uh implementing god uh god's ordinances and and so and and, and what what you what you eventually say is that th this would eventually lead to a kind of a, um a kind of argument that that somehow um will lead to a kind of legitimization of 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 of, uh, of tyranny in, in 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 a certain sense um and and and, and i think for 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 my case, I, I I kind of see this uh, quite a bit, especially in 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 the later centuries. You know, starting in the eleventh century, especially with with um, with the rise of civil wars, and then with with uh, you know the Boyids coming in, and then the Seljuks. Uh, there's this idea, especially among the juridical class, the jurists, especially in their writings, in 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 uh, their the chapters on the on the imama and in kalam discourses and and of course with with someone like Juwaini Mawardi, there's a sense that uh, um, you know I, I, it, it's important to 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 preserve the the moral order of society and so regardless of who comes in and who comes out as a ruler, uh, you have to just kind of well, bear with them is, is one thing, but the most important thing is to is to maintain the moral legitimacy of uh that society um the the the, the umma in, in the sense so i i i i thought you know what 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 you what you kind of presented kind of sect into what i viewed as very intriguing uh in in the in the 11th century and, and in fact this is is a kind of starting point for my own work i i i've 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 be, i'm kind of beginning to look at the the political discourses of Preachers, uh, um, someone like Ibn Al-Jawzi has perhaps tried to counter that um, this this whole idea of um, uh, um, kind of legitimizing um, certain moral failings for the sake of preserving order. So this is just a, a comment. On. No, this is this is actually very important, and you know, I mean. There is a corresponding um, discourse in the Siyasa about this issue of tyranny, right? Um, so, uh, and I would be, you know, I mean, I'd be glad to hear from you, actually, how does that, how that works, actually, in the Imamat discourse or in later uh, periods. But here is the dilemma. There is a corresponding concern in the Siyasa about this, uh, about the issue of tyranny, uh, right and legitimate legitimate authority. So we can talk about the imamat discourses question later on, but you know I mean for the siyasa. So the idea of rulership in siyasa is not like uh, the imamat discourse understanding of the caliph. In the siyasa discourse that you know I'm talking about in here and in later period as well is that the political authority is given to rulers by God. This is not like the other one in the imamat where you have the prophet, where you have the community, where you have a religious law, the Quran. This is a separate, really, just basically grace bestowed upon rulers, uh, right? Separate from the other, uh, you know, from the other graces that the gods uh, that that god actually gives like prophecy for example right so here is the question that how uh, for the intellectuals in the siyasa discourse the main question is that how then you tame this really ultimately destructive power you know, i mean somebody has the power that you know you you do not define you do not control. You did not. You did not give. 
So this is the whole discussion about the issues of, you know, I mean, legitimacy, good governance and the like. And I give two examples in the book that, you know, I hope to talk about in here, but we didn't get a chance. Let me mention them right in here. One of them is a that I quoted a passage from Abdul Hamid about a siyasa being like, for example, the example of the animal trainer with the horse. Right. I mean, do you remember that Atala from the book? Maybe, right? So, I mean, over there, I mean, the worry that, but that he says that, you know, I mean, I, I you can't just basically force the horse to do what you want her to do. That requires siyasa, that you have to be gentle, you have to be nice, you have to know your business. And this, he says, well, it's an ex is, is an example for not only dealing with the sovereign, but also dealing for the sovereign dealing with his subjects. So, and, you know, I mean, there is a fast, fast Fantastic discussion by Jack Derrida about this matter when he talks about, you know, fables and the significance of fables. And he talks about, you know, I mean, about the beast and the sovereign. This is really the title of his, you know, collection of essays and the book. Uh, is that, uh, well, the, the beast, the horse of, uh, of Abdul Hamid, and the sovereign resemble each other in one thing, and that is both of them are outside the law. Right? One of them is below the law, which is the animal, and the other one is above the law or alongside the law. So the main question of the siyasa becomes, therefore, how do you train the horse not to kick? Right? How do you train someone who is supposed to protect the social order, not destroy the order that he is supposed to uh, basically protect? So then, therefore, yeah, I mean, the whole, whole issue of tyranny, the whole issue of justice, the whole issue of consent, the whole issue of uh, governance, good governance, relates to this, you know, this matter. How do you basically tame the beast? This is not, you know, this is, I mean, this is a, a discussion different from, you know, power corrupts, right? It is a different kind of thing. This is actually power by its nature is destructive, right? So then therefore the whole business becomes basically the way, establishing ways to tame that sovereign power, to make it amenable to an orderly society. And here, you know, I mean, obviously, eh, probably you have similar discussion in the Imam al discourse. I know there is, obviously, you know, because my first book was about the formation of the Sunni political thought uh, in Arabic, is that, you know, I mean, the difference I think in here is that the ulama kept thinking about religious law, religious ordinances as a way to tame the caliph's rule or the ruler's rule, right? In the siyasa, you don't see that kind of really emphasis on the fuqaha, the ulama, and the religious rules and regulations that uh, they promulgate. Thank you to you both. Thank you to anyone who's watching this. And if you are interested in this, then you are of, of, of elite mind, and we are interested in talking to you more. So uh, we'll end it there. Don't forget to visit our uh, sponsors, um, IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org. .ihrc uh, final words from you, Hansian, and then any final words from you, Hayrati? No, but I say, uh, Taha, thank you so much for uh, you know having me on board. Uh, this was great. Thank you. Always appreciate and I'd like the uh, podcast. And I also would like to thank you, Tala. This is a fantastic program for hosting me. And thank you very much for you, um, to, to you, actually, Han Hissien, for, you know, coming and actually sharing the platform and discussing, you know, discussing this book. Um, and I hope the listeners also would enjoy, you know, some of the conversation that we have uh, in here. Thank you.